Yeah, sorry, I'm still trying to get this working right. That should be a black screen. I don't know why. It works. <laughs> Just gonna load it to you. There we go. Um, all right. Yeah, sorry, I'm struggling to like this busy day to get cut up. I have to like present the same thing again. Uh, there should be, yeah, slide, view slideshow maybe there. So, there we go. Okay. So, um, apologies on this may be a little bit brief. Uh, it's also kind of tough in that each like, slide could be at an hour long presentation. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, if you guys have questions, uh, feel free to like, interrupt and ask them. Um, if there's something that's unclear, or if you have like a, you know, one time I found this was the issue, like that's a good thing to bring up. Um, I'm gonna try to bring up a couple of those in here, like reminding about the routing loop, it's not in, but it needs to be in. Uh, and fun with, with VMware. So, uh, also, it's gonna be just IPv6 because, sorry, IPv4 because IPv6 is a whole other animal. And is the uh, addresses are huge and like hard to deal with, and they have different notation uh, for shortcuts, and a whole lot of um, command line tools and stuff do not work very well with IPv6. Um, that, and I don't have any hands on experience with IPv6, and I don't really care to. <laughs> one day on, uh, one day I'll be forced to happen. All right, so uh, kind of overview here, talking about uh, conceptually how you lay a network, like what all the different layers are, so that we can try to figure out where your issues are and focus on that, and then kind of go through a few issues that can, a few things to check what the problem is um, through each layer. So, I uh, just, uh, you know, this kind of got inspired from the Slack conversation, and it's a thing that it's just come up so many times over the years, um, like even outside of the procedure group and stuff. Um, that I, I thought, heck, you know, it might give people to learn a little bit more about the magic boosters of networking. Uh, so much is done for you for us now automatically that like you don't have to know as much, which is great, but also means when things break because they're hyper complicated and it's a lot harder to troubleshoot. So, anyway. Um, so yeah, when you have some kind of connection issue, you don't know what it is, um, the first thing you do is try to start with the error message. If, if that can, if that come out of your knowledge, helps you limit the scope of where the issue might be, um, start there. Um, and then try to test issues specifically related to that. Uh, and then if you just don't know or if that doesn't work, man, sometimes you just gotta go up and down the whole stack. So I say like, Pick you the top or the bottom, start there, and go the other way. I want to do that a lot, unfortunately. Um, there's two kind of conceptual models for how that works. One's the OSI model, one's the TCP IP model. That's on the next slide. They're basically the same with some minor. The TCP IP is shorter and it combines with you these groups. So you've got um, the physical layer. Which um, is also Wi Fi. Some people think this goes on the cable. Uh, just remember it's also Wi Fi. Um, the, that's kind of intertwined you know, strong with the data link layer. It's the protocol that works over that physical medium. Um, and then you've got the networking. So it's going to be an internet protocol or IP called ICMP. You have some uh, VPNs that operate at this level. Like the, the set VPNs. Um, there's all sorts of routing protocols too that we will not be talked about here. Uh, if you have questions about those, you probably know more networking stuff than this presentation is going to cover. So 
new max to you. Um, the transfer layer is using TCP and UDP sessions, which is uh, session connection information. Although the next part is the new session, which is why I get confused sometimes. Um, the top three are usually combined in the application layer because the application handles most of that stuff. Um, that's why when you have 200 Chrome tabs open, Chrome actually knows what packet goes to which tab. That's already within the application there and across the protocol that application speaks. Again, this is just kind of combining the two so you can, you can see the difference. Um, yeah, layer three is your IP address, four is your port, is another good way to think about it. Uh, network interface part is all your physical local network stuff, and the application is software stuff running. Um, you can client or server stuff. So we're going to start at the uh, bottom of this and open it up. Um, if you have an issue with the physical layer, usually it's a physical connection or Wi-Fi issue. Um, sometimes you're able to connect, but then you have intermittent traffic and you don't know what's going on. Um, that could be a physical issue. Uh, if you can't connect at all, like, you know, yeah, if you can't connect at all, <laughs> There's, uh, I've seen so many loose cables in my life, and there's that little clippy thing on the end of your internet cable that breaks off because it's made of like the flimsiest cheap plastic. Um, and that breaks off and it slides down, and it just makes, yeah. So that could be an issue. Um, if you have a cable that you love and you've had for centuries, and you're having network problems, and you think, oh, it can't be this cable because it's been around for forever. Replace the cable. Just try it. It's yeah. like a five dollar problem that will save hours of time. Yeah, and have extra cables for that end, so you don't have to run out and inspect it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, While you're at it, if you're going to replace the like, replace the cable, replace it with Cat Six as well. I've had issues a couple times with the physical side here. Where I've ran my cable too close to fluorescence or something, and that's made errors where it would connect, but it wouldn't give a solid connection. Yep, that's going to be the EMI part of this. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, yeah, Cat Six has extra shielding as opposed to Cat Five E. So Cat Five doesn't have shielding. Cat Five E has some. It's just like loose tin foil, um, and that's around the whole bundle of wires. So you have the whole bundle and one sheet. For Cat 5D, um, your Cat 6 is going to have each individual wire there to be shielded. Some of that depends on if it's STP, UTP, FTP. Because, like, I have Cat 6 unshielded, but that's because I'm a cheapskate. It shouldn't be. <laughs> yeah, because it's so it's so it's UTP is generally just in Paris. Yeah. <laughs> unshielded plus the pair. Very yeah, sorry, I should but yeah, but yeah, but, the, but some of what you're saying they didn't have the specifications before they built it, so they added features as they built up the specs. Okay, uh, yeah, the, the wire I use is Ubiquity wire that's uh, it's Cat 5 wire, but it's the larger gauge of Cat 6, it just doesn't have the individual wire shielding, it has the outside shielding for all of them, but not individual ones. It works pretty good though. The only physical issues I've seen that don't have on the slides, this is very comprehensive, are using a four pair phone cable instead of an Ethernet cable. What? Yeah. No, that shouldn't. <laughs> I know it should. But since it's still an APHC connector, they plugged it in and they got some network uh, and complained about it once later that it was always really slow. Was this a modem? No, this was an end user at an office building. So they just like found the cable in there. Because no, no, it's, it's on the right size. No, it yeah. is. A lot, a lot of office phones have the the eight p size connector on the end. And some of like the old, back in the old school, it, it might be technically like Cat three or something. Okay. But it's it's basically a four pair phone cable that has the same PHD connector. Okay. And therefore they were using it as an ethernet and it gave 
enough signal. Yeah, what you're talking about is registered Jack 48. RJ45 is the, the Jack for Ethernet, but RJ48 is what they used for phones and T1 back in the day. Gotcha. Yes. So, yeah, I refer to it as APAC connector because I can never remember my RJs. The, the weirdest EMI I actually ever got was on a phone system, the uh, digital uh, 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 trunk uh, phone system, and there was a gal who had her cell phone that she'd set right next to her uh, desk phone, and it actually induced uh, signal on the wire, and it was just the right kind of weird stuff that it would actually cause the voicemail system to crash in a way that we had to have the vendor uh, connect in and correct whatever corruption happened to the database uh, that was handling the uh, voicemail system. And after days of fighting that uh, and noticing that it only happened when she was in the office because she was uh, a sales assistant, so she wasn't there all the time, she was out places. We eventually just had her put her cell phone on the other end of her desk <laughs> and the problem went away. <laughs> That's awesome. Because I, I was too lazy to actually climb through the uh, the false ceiling and debris pole cable to fix the problem. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen people run cable next to fluorescent lights in the ceiling. Yep. That's another drama. Uh, and like speakers will have strong magnets. So that's another thing to look out for. If the speaker's not shielded properly, then the magnets can come out. And looking at that, things to about it. The, the worst one that um, the magnet's not heard. nearly as bad as the AC that's coming for, from the speaker wires. Yeah, uh, the, the worst one that that when I was talking to that vendor about the voicemail problem, they said they had a phone system in a surgical suite, and whenever they fired up the electro electro power <laughs> gun, uh, it would actually start dialing out. <laughs> yeah, awesome. That's the first version of telemetry right there. Wow. And after a few international phone calls, they they ended up uh, re-jiggering uh, things and uh, grounding things out so that that would stop happening. I would have to assume that took some very specific filters to filter out that, that frequency that was getting sent in. Yeah, I think they ended up running some very heavily shielded cable into that room. Because they, they had gone with just the cheapest phone you know, uh, cabling as possible. Because, I mean, businesses are businesses and they've done it cheap. Yeah. Plus, it's a hospital, which, speaking of being cheap, that ties into the only other issue I've seen that's not on this slide, which is uh, an electrical contractor that had to move some Ethernet cables. So they used a little red push button like wire joiners. To just extend Ethernet cables. So each of the handful of Ethernet cables had eight of these little push button joiners on it. So they were untwisted for like a solid three inches and all just kind of bundled together. Yeah, those those have also got about seven meg on a good day. I mean, yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pretty comprehensive. Yeah. <laughs> Bad cables. So, yeah. Uh, and then the Wi-Fi thing on there too. I mean, most people have this Wi-Fi stuff. So if you can't get that to at all, or it's intermittent signal issues, there's different channels you can be on. Most home devices will be like hard set to a certain channel. Um, you can use like a, uh, an app on your phone to, to take a look at the saturation and move it to another channel. The smarter stuff will actually on a good one. It's less congested. Um, you might be in, let's say, San Francisco's BART and notice that there is a signal being jammed, something like that. Uh, yeah, that, that, there are some federal places where they will jam signals, um, like especially if you think there's a driver bomb, like at a federal building or something, they will jam cell phone signals and stuff there. So that could be why your Wi Fi doesn't work. Um, it's very, very illegal to do it on your own, even though it, you know, it's not super hard if you know how. You're just sending out a really loud noise signal. Also near prisons. Oh, really? Uh, that way, that the story? inmates' uh, cell phones can't uh, call out oh, if they yeah. happen to have one in uh, hidden places. There you go. So, 
if you're in prison watching this, you, your cell phone can't connect. That's why. Um, but yeah, the other Wi Fi thing that probably everyone here has experienced is a captive portal. You can connect to your Wi Fi, but you get like a, an explanation or something saying there's no internet. Uh, yeah, just open your browser and that should solve itself. Got yeah, be issue with microwaves as well. Yeah, microwaves. That used to be more of a thing. Like you'd be playing like a real tournament or something, and someone would microwave a burrito and get dropped. <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen that in a long time. Um, but yeah, so if you're not actually physically inspecting a bunch of these cables, especially if they're walls and such, what's another way to tell from the system side? Um, you can look for like uh, that's that dash I. We'll show you the um, RX error and the RX drop stuff and TXR and TX drop. We'll show you the drop packets and error packets. Um, if config, I knew that's what I always used to use, or you know, I have config and it would show drop packets. Um, now that everything's with IP address, like I don't know if it's the same. I think there's a similar thing, but I haven't tested it, so I just didn't want to, you know, come out here and say it. Someone has used IP address and knows that shows it. Speak up. Okay. Um, so too big. There we go. Um, yeah. So also depending on your the TCP or UDP part, TCP if it notices it, it'll ask for another packet to come back and try to reload the session UDP. It does weird things and just keeps going. Um, so, like if you uh, have a VoIP phone and stuff's dropping out and you can't hear people all the time, then that's a, some kind of hacker loss. Um, that step dash S also shows you a ridiculous amount of stuff in way more detail. Um, it's too much to show on the screen. So, run that out in your own system and kind of look at it and be like, huh, that's a lot of information that I hadn't known about. This until uh, doing this presentation. So, if you feel like you don't know enough to speak, uh, make a presentation. You will learn enough to speak. Uh, can't confirm. <laughs> uh, okay, so that was all layer one. Uh, layer two is your local network stuff. It is before the IP network layer. Um, it deals with MAC addresses and hearts. Uh, it's basically Similar to DNS and some other like NetBias and LLMR kind of stuff, and uh, there's MGNS as well. Those are all like local network type protocols that will say, Hey, I want to talk to this other computer. Anybody know where it's at? And then anyone else on that network, usually the computer you're asking for, will say, Oh, yeah, that's me. Here's how you talk to me. Uh, and then they'll provide you a MAC address to IP address. That way you can connect over and talk to them. Um, the MAC address is should be unique to your device. It's got two parts, the vendor code, which is an OUI, and like a serial number that it should be unique from that vendor. Um, they had to reuse some of these. So it's, it's, you know, stuff's been around. It's, Billions of devices, they exhausted the uh, amount of uh, pool that they have available. But OUI is a pretty cool, you can look them up, you can discover a nice thing, uh, a little bit of info about stuff on your network just using that too. Uh, so I can give you a RF A, I'll show you everything on the network. Uh, what is OUI? Something, something to note with MAC addresses is uh, with uh, like Apple's private MAC addresses they have for their Wi Fi networking. They just randomize it now. So even the OUI is hard to actually identify a device from nowadays. Yep. It, it's great sometimes. Uh, I was scanning the, the Wi Fi in my neighborhood and I can tell that my neighbor's got, you know, a doorbell from a certain company because the OUI shows up to that. That's a device that still is linked to that brand. Whereas Apple devices, you can't tell if it's an Apple device anymore because they randomize it now. Yeah, TVs are good for that. Um... Home thermostats, which looks like weird, crazy devices out there. You can better tell what they are just by doing some art project, like art connections. Um, so, yeah, art dash will show everything in your art table. 
like DNS, it's a short lived cache that holds on to it. Uh, I'm going to say two or three minutes and then I'll ask again. Um, or uh, our scan is to uh, check this out. I'm going to assume this is on that range. I think we are. It was organizational identifier. Yep. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I just uh, posted it. Thank okay. you. I entered the chat afterwards, so I can't see the history. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a very different idea. Orange. And from experience, I can say that the less a vendor's product relates to networking, the more likely you are to have MAC address collisions. Yeah. So yeah, here we go. I just um, perp scanned everything on the network here. Uh, I gravitate so you can see all the things responding. Um, there's me. A couple Sonos devices. Um, yeah, mo most people never look at this or care, never have to. Um, side story was doing the cyber defense competition up in Ames a few years back. We had you know, our whole network behind one firewall, and I changed the back of that firewall to a Sony PSP because I thought it'd be hilarious if they actually noticed it. Like, who runs Active Directory on the Sony handheld game console? Uh, <laughs> nobody knows. It, so, yeah. This is just one of those, I don't know, probably not very useful things, but it's kind of cool. <laughs> With, uh, from uh, the type of defense standpoint, it would give you a uh, hint on. Well, you know, it's an Apple uh, Mac address, so my my first go-to attacks would be Apple-based. Yeah. Um, so that, that's a good point because um, it is information leakage, but like there's so much information leakage and most of it doesn't matter a whole lot. Yeah, it's hyper-local information leakage. Yeah, that, that specifically. Um, and like both of you guys are yeah, like a few people have said, you can change your MAC address. Apple does it. Um, Android, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah how it's optimized it. But you can actually set it to a specific thing if you want. Like Linux will let you set it to whatever you want. Yeah. Um, yeah I personally like to set dead beef in there just in case someone's looking at it. Yeah. Um, if you do have a MAC address collision, that would be a thing that would break your network. Uh, <laughs> if you see it, like record a video and post it because it's it's a rare event. It's not. I've, I've definitely <laughs> dealt with MAC address collision before. I've tried to restore my router. Uh, my router is, you know, a PFSense box that runs inside of a virtual machine. But trying to restore it with the same MAC addresses while the other one was running still to try to, you know, keep it up alive the whole time it was going, uh, it didn't work out so smoothly. Uh, yeah, starting to get conflicts. The ARP tables start to fight fight you, and they're like, "No, I've already got something there." And trying to clear them, and yeah, definitely a problem having conflicts there. But it's usually it's not something you run into. Right. I'm surprised that uh, hypervisor gave you the same MAC address. Like usually they, I think they set up a new interface. Huh. Interesting. It's also a fun way to poison I your. I think network. it was when I moved to machines. I had two different hypervisors running it. I had backed oh, it up okay. while it was running, moved the the offline backup, and turned it online on a second machine. Yeah, like I said, it's yeah. not something you run into very often. It was a very specific set of circumstances that led me there. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, so layer three is the you know, next layer up the stack there. Uh, there's two main protocols that people use at this level. First, ICMP, more commonly more known as ping. Uh, that ping trace route, the two big commands on leverage ICMP. Um, for those who want to know what acronyms mean, it's the internet control message protocol. Uh, if it's trivia, it uses no ports. If everything else in the OSI model stack from um, you know transfer on up like is not used by CMP. It is its own thing. So 
this is it, your best, your basic way of, can I talk to anything else on the network? Like, okay, I was able to arch stuff and, you know, I can see that. Uh, another good layer two thing is if you turn a Wireshark or another packet capture and you see stuff, like anything at all, your, your layer two is probably mostly or completely working. Um, but yeah. ICMP um, on Linux, if you ping, it will ping forever unless you pass in dash C for count in the number. Uh, I just do for it because that's what other operating systems kind of default to. Um, if you are looking for latency spikes, you can just ping forever and then watch it and then see if, if you get different uh, milliseconds. Um, a lot of times, latency issues are very random and you have to watch it for a while. So uh, uh, you can also set it to while it's doing infinite ping, start going messing with wires to see if your ping starts going uh, wild. <laughs> yeah, if you want to. Um, so there's equal information that ping will show you. Um, there's a sequence number and it just by default counts up, but you can, yeah, sequence numbers is just running stuff. TTL is the time to live. Uh, that's how long your packet can exist on the network before it gets automatically dropped to the routers. This is a very important thing. Um, before time to live, if you sent something out, it could possibly hit a routing loop and it could possibly be forwarded forever. Uh, so yeah, that's why time to live is there. It counts down, so this is set to 117. Once it's past 117 routers, it's, it just drops and disappears, and people throw it away. So it's a digital garbage can. Uh, times in milliseconds, you can see what kind of latency you've got. Uh, wi Fi is always going to introduce latency. Um, but yeah, this all of a sudden is like a thousand milliseconds or more or timeouts here, then you know that you have some kind of intermittent issue. Um, a good example I have. Uh, the line for my internet provider buried in the backyard. Um, they didn't put proper shielding on it, and water got in, it was causing mm -hmm. shorts to it. And so, very unpredictably, there'd be just enough moisture to totally drop my connection. Um, and other times, it would just be high latency. And so, I was able to use this to show that yes, there's some kind of a latency issue. And then I started um, using uh, pings to all the next hops in my network to find out where that latency issue was. So from my laptop to my router, ping that. Never any latency issues. Okay, that connection is cool. Uh, ping from my laptop to the modem. Okay, no latency issues there. Like that's been fine. Ping that outside of the network. Low Nelly, there's the problem. So that's just kind of a good methodology for trying to troubleshoot where exactly on the network your she is. So another thing that uh, SCP will help do is okay, actually trace route. So trace route, what that does is it's a pin that decrements your time to live. Oh, sorry, it messes with your time to live. So it starts off with time to live on one. And then it goes again, the time will go two. And it keeps on going until it reaches its destination. So I don't think I would install, but if, if you trace route, you know, Google or whatever, it'll go to your next top, usually your router, next hop after that, next hop after that, all the way until it gets to the destination. In this case, it'd be you know, eight, nine, nine, eight, nine, eight. And once it does that, it will finish the trace route. Uh, that's uh, networking issue, we can see where which hop along the network is causing the latency. And it's really good for the parts of the network you don't have control over, and which is usually, you know, past your ISP. Do you have a trace path that it's good? No, why not? I do. Thank you. I didn't, uh, didn't know that was the replacement. Yeah, uh, the, the, chat, the chat, there was a yeah, message in the, in the chat there. That's true. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. 
a tool that I didn't know existed until a support technician told me about it, but I found very useful is MTR. It's kind of like a cross between top and trace path or trace route. Hmm. It displays like continually updating like average of what hops are doing, what and latencies and all that. Okay. That's cool. NTR, I'll have to check that out. Um, so this is a good example for the uh, trace route and trace path. We see all these no replies. Um, those devices are blocking ICMP, which you will see it certain larger things. Um, and so it's not going to tell you the information back. Um, you can potentially use this to get network information about somebody else's network, like so that ping will be allowed all the way past all their routers and security appliances and whatnot, and load balancers back to the original thing. Um, and then you can kind of map out how many hops and get information about that. It's not a lot of information, and it's not a big deal. People will block it. The other thing you can do with ICMP is with pings, you have echo through uh, you know, echoes and echo replies. And within that, um, it sends an arbitrary text over. And you can uh, actually exfiltrate and steal data out of the network by putting that within a ping request. Um, and so that's another reason some places might block ping. Well, there always used to be also tricks where you could do sort of a back scatter splatter where. You could send out a bunch of pings and then have where they're supposed to respond to as a different IP address and then uh, uh, sort of use that as a amplification attack to uh, DDoS somebody. Yep, yeah. So uh, you used to be able to, to do that because you could spoof the request. Yeah. Um, but it's not so much anymore. But no, I believe the routers prevent that. Uh, like, like the routing code will not pass on the ICMP message if the IP address doesn't match. Mistakes were made. Yeah, yeah. People break things. Uh, there was also a vulnerability in the ping of death that was like a, a really old one from Windows and stuff where, um, again, it was that kind of like you send way too much data and ping, you can send a bunch of them and it'll amplify the attack and crash the system. Um, they said the evil bit. <laughs> when I was in school, I had fun testing out the ping of death. I, uh, I had a bunch of virtual machines running from a, a, all, all sorts of stuff from Windows 3.1 onto like Windows XP is where I ended. But I did the ping of death on all of them to see how each one fared. And it was, I got some really weird results. Uh, basically, it killed everything, but like, Windows 95, I want to say it was, handled it pretty well. Uh, something to do with it just dumped all its extra stuff off instead of trying to do something with it. So it's interesting stuff. Yeah. All right. So uh, next up on the layer two list is IP or internet protocol. Do you have an IP address that's looking at me? Um, if you have a really strange IP address within this 169.254 or something, something range, it means you have an IPA address, which uh, I don't remember the acronym because it doesn't matter, but it's basically a private IP address. Um, and it's what happens when you cannot connect to uh, another like IPv4 network. And so by default, some operating systems, uh, especially Windows, will just create this network for you. And so that way, if, like let's say everyone here in the room wanted to have our systems talk to each other, but we didn't have a router, we only had a switch, we could plug all our devices into the switch, which would be a layer two connection. Um, and it would make up the you know the TCP routing stuff and basically let us communicate through that. So it stands for automatic private IP addressing. There you go. Um if you see this in your network on our system, you probably have a broken <laughs> IPv4 stuff. Unless you're in the cloud, this is used for metadata services like AWS and Azure. Um, yeah, it's totally normal and maybe a security risk, uh, but you don't have any choice of it because it's on the network and they deny it. 
but it's it's how they'll talk. You can talk. Your system can talk with like the cloud service stack, oftentimes. Um, DHCP is another issue. So dynamic post configuration protocol. I remember that one. Um, basically, when you hop onto a network, DHCP gives you dynamic or changing IP address. Your system, uh, the system's like, hey, I want an IP address. Is there anybody out there who'll give me one? And the DHCP server says, yep, I'll do that. Um, here's how long you can have it. Uh, here's the addresses I'm offering to you. Your client says, okay, I'll take this one. And then the HTTP server marks it down, reserves it, and hands it back to you. Maybe not reserve, uh, keeps track of it. Uh, another cool thing you can do is you can like you can reserve an IP address for a specific MAC address from nicer DHCP solutions, um, which is usually handled under router on home devices. Um, and when your GHCP client requests an IP address by default. They usually request the same address it used to have. That's its preferred IP. Um, and then it's up to the GCP server or not they're in the back or the different one. Uh, if you cannot get an IP address and you expect to be using DHCP, okay, yeah, there's a problem. Um, start looking there. Uh, if you like to statically configure your IP address and you switch networks and you forgot you did that. Like, I don't know, let's say you have a game console and you set up port forwarding on it and you set up a static IP address so your port forwards don't break. And then you take it over to your friend's house and why does it not work? That's why. Um, yeah. So, therefore, this is like going to be mostly the last layer. So, if anybody's worried about how long you're taking, um, the other stuff's not a hand waiting for me. So let, um, layer four, TCP and UDP are two uh, ground protocols for that. Um, transport control protocol and something. The universal data frame protocol, I said. Yeah, I think that's yeah. right. Uh, basically, TCP is a three-way handshake. It is, it's like, hi, I want to talk to you. Send act all that, right? I, um, I understand you want to talk to me. Yep. And so <laughs> you do also put his hand out and say, Yes, I will make this connection. And so then we have a moment. That's what TCP does. It gives you a moment to talk to somebody else. Uh, UDP, however, is shouting into the room, which is what I'm doing right now. I'm going to keep talking, and I don't care if anyone else is listening or hears me or wants to speak. That's UDP. I'd tell UDP a joke, but you might not get it. Nope. And I don't care. <laughs> and it's actually user datagram, not universal. I was wrong about that. For those that wonder, oh, on a test. <laughs> <laughs> um, so these are ports, um, IPs, IP address ports. You add them all together, you get like a quintuplet. Um, and then that. Combination is extremely important in the networking world. Um, yeah. TCP will make that connection. It will resend data um, if things are out of sequence or dropped. Um, it will, it's a lot friendlier, and, but it, there's some overhead for it. So it's not quite as fast. That mattered a lot more when the internet was slow. Now, you know, gigabit and all that, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't slow things down. Enough. Uh, UDP is great for broadcasts. Like our Zoom presentation right now, I guarantee you it should be going over it. Well, maybe not guarantee you. It's probably going over UDP, uh, especially the voice part of it. Um, and so part of it cuts out, it just drops it in that lost forever. Um, firewalls usually operate these levels, so we do port forwarding, stuff like that. Um, either Post based or network based firewalls are at this level. You might hear some next gen firewalls that will do application level inspection, and that's stuff higher up the stack. So, whereas a normal, like a dumb firewall, will say, well, you can open port 80 to a certain IP, uh, an application level firewall will 
look at the traffic coming in over 480 and make sure it's HTTP and make sure that you're not doing something stupid like trying to run a SSH over HTTP over 480. Maybe not stupid, unexpected. <laughs> they unexpected. Um, because that's the way that people have gotten around things in the past. Um, yeah, by default, the firewalls are just allow, allow connections outbound usually. Um, if the firewalls aren't blocking anything, it just blocks uninitiated inbound connections. That's called um, being stateful, remembering that this server wanted to go out and talk, and then it's expecting a response back. That's why you don't have to open up holes in your firewall um, to have like a bunch of traffic back to you or something like that. Or if you want to SSH out to another system and your firewall blocks everything inbound, you're still able to make that connection because it's stateful. Um, there are like firewall logs where you can check for some of this stuff. There are connection tables, uh, like IP connection tracking tables you can look at, all sorts of rabbit holes to go down there. Um, but basically, the easiest, best way is if you have a problem here and map it. Like if the Fed map connects, you're good. Um, if it doesn't at all, you've got problems. <laughs> um, uh, if you don't have a map running and you're less, let's say you're trying to use a web browser, if you go to a web server and you're having an issue, um, in Chrome, it will tell you if DNS is an issue, it will say like, unable to resolve that, that address or that name. Um, that says, I name resolution is DNS. Um, if it's like request timed out, then man, I sent the request where I was told to send it and I never heard back. And at that point, either that one server is down or there's some kind of firewall issue blocking it or the service listening on the website is down or the whole dang server is turned off. Um, things, things on that side. The other issue could be if your internet is completely down, you will see the request timeout because it's trying to go anywhere in the camp. Um, we've got things on the IP level. I don't come back to that. Um, yeah, so I can I can demo and map. That's like the only other thing here on this level. Um, before you do that, I'm going to come back to IP. IP also has uh, routing tables. This is what I, okay, this is what I meant for. So you can see what your IP address is by running the IP address command. We'll show you that for your uh, interfaces. There's a loopback interface that allows you just to talk to yourself. It's always there. Um, it's also known as localhost. Local host. The address for that is 127.0.0.1. It's uh, Linux also will name it a loopback. So you can see that. Um, you can check your routes. Uh, by an IP route, you have to have a route. If you don't, the uh, traffic has no idea where to go. Um, the next thing we were talking about, like from your system to the next hop, is like your router to the next hop. What those hops are and where to go is based on routing. Um, you always have a default route, you should have a default route. Uh, and that says, like, if I don't know where to go, I'm just going to close my eyes and chuck it this way. Right? And so that's going to be your default route. Um, if you have network issues, you can try pinging your default route. If you can't ping it, those are the problems between your device and that next topic. Um, if you have multiple interfaces, then each interface should have its own route. You might have multiple connections out, like, like a routing table. Uh, the router will have multiple connections. And so you could have a whole bunch of different routes, specifically this subnet goes here, this subnet goes here, and then a default route goes over there. Uh, you can have routing loops, like I mentioned before. And that's where, let's say, let's say you and I have routes. <laughs> and, and I'm like, all right, I've got a, my default route is you, and I just chuck everything to you. My default route is you, and I chuck it back. Yep. And so Jared says, hey, I want to go to Google, and I'm like, here you go, Andrew. 
Here you go. Here you go. Here you go. To infinity. And not beyond. It just stops there. So uh, let the TTL, it will die out eventually. Otherwise, that traffic will consume bandwidth forever. Um, yeah, I actually had to prove that at one point with a provider. <laughs> and it took weeks because he couldn't admit he was wrong. It took upper management from both companies getting involved. Uh, and I proved it with the trace route because you do the trace route back to you. I'm just like, okay, my device, my router, their router, my router, their router, my router, their router. router. Sent that over an email, it's still in the it. Took a while. So, no use you just out, proving our piece. Oh, I was going to do uh, an app real quick. Yeah, man. Uh, you should do an app. You were tip for a North American yeah. 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 company. All right. Uh, that's Let's, no, let's, let's pick a, you want to pick a look, you want to pick me? Their hands off. So, MAP is uh, resolves, goes, the DNS stuff will talk to you in a second, but it connects the IP for that. Oh, here we go, IP6 addresses. Um, or an IPv4. So, it connects to that address, it tries a bunch of ports. Uh, and here you can see there's two ports open, 88443 for redhat.com. Um, so that lets you know if I open a browser, I should be able to get to these things. Um, there might be SSL issues that could be a problem since connections don't like self signed certificates, or there might be like a cipher um, disagreement. Like somebody wants to use SSL V2 or V3 and your device doesn't want to talk to it because it's all this hell. You shouldn't be on the internet anymore. Now that could be an issue. Um, another thing you can do is this service detection will actually see if it's HTTP running on those two ports um, because by default, you don't do service detection. And that it just says, this port's normally used by this. I don't know if it is or not, but usually. Here will actually go, and if it knows the version, it will tell you. So, like if that was Apache, it would say Apache, if it was IIS, it would say that. Apparently, it's the Akamai Ghost web server. So, anyway. uh, in order to do that, like it actually gets the head of it. So, so I'm going to curl just getting the headers for that had. And you can see right here the server is called my ghost, which is what this data is. So, and that's pretty good for that. Um, yeah. So, is the NAS, except it's not, uh, is that's the hype of it? So, oh. it was DNS. Computer went to sleep. This is like a big internet meme, and uh, it personally bothers me, so you can buy into it if you want. I should do like a whole talk about how DNS works. But um, the best way is to check out DNS test lookup. We'll use what your configured DNS resolver is. Might be local, and might be uh, provided to you via DHCP. Um, but I'll try to resolve something. Dig is a great way of using any DNS resolver. So the command here, dig at HR8 says, I want you to go to the HR8 resolver and ask it what the records are for google.com. Um, and so this is a really good way to see is it your DNS or is it DNS in general is, is the issue. Um, because if your DNS is a problem, you just blame the other, you know, recipient records on it, and then we look at But this will return to you data back, say, yeah, google.com is at this IP address here. And it's in the record. Uh, but then you know DNS is working and not the problem. So um, if you 
make a request and then there's no record that comes back, then you know that there's an issue with somebody else's DNS record. Um, DNS records also have a time to live and they will expire, I believe. I want to say the reason why you're this example is the time to live. I want to say it's minutes, but again, this isn't a DNS talk, so. The other big problem you can run into is certain cable company providers around here, if you're using their DNS server, yeah. uh, even if the domain doesn't exist, they'll respond <laughs> and say, oh, it's my ad server is yeah. the answer. And then when you open it up, then you'll get, uh, so you were looking for uh, site X and well, here's the Google search with our advertisements in it for site X to be helpful. Yep. That's a fantastic reminder to change the DNS resolver to not use your ISP. Uh, also, if you have, whether it's an employer provided or your own or whatever, any sort of blood filtering software, a lot of times, if those, I mean, if those are not doing SSL decryption, then usually you don't get a fancy block page when you go to something you're not supposed to, you get an SSL error page because they are made in the middle of the DNS. Yeah, it depends how they do that. There's a lot of ways they can choose to do it. Um, you can DNS if you have a web proxy. You can do that so decryption or not. You can base on domain names entirely, not website content. Yeah, there's a lot of ways. Yeah, which, uh, especially on like uh, WSL uh, two machines where your network isn't your own, uh, it totally breaks. Uh, everything when they're man in the middle and their their certificate isn't included by default inside your fake yeah. machine. So you have to import the decryption certificate on your system. Yeah. But that's a good uh, thing with corporate environments too, because like the Windows devices will get uh, like a GPO or something uh, pushed out with that certificate for your Linux devices unless they're should unless you have some other software that does it for you. Program. That's a whole other talk on how to <laughs> yeah. update your certificates. I mean, that could be, that could be a talk of bypassing enterprise security controls. Like, <laughs> like when you really need to check out Reddit or something, you know? Um, yeah, I ran out of time for this. So, uh, another really good way of trying to figure out what's going on is taking packet captures or peek outs. Uh, TCP numbers, the plan line tool, uh, dash SDO says um recording the entirety of the packet otherwise it just does like the headers not the data um you, have to, you can specify your interface you can specify ips that by source or destination or ports um or you can just grab it all um, you can write out your file and you can send that file to somebody else and ask for help or or you can load it out um so like if you have station server tcp down Send it back to your own desktop, open it Wireshark or something. Um, and Wireshark would be the other thing that you can do. You can also take packet captures in Wireshark. Um, I've got a couple of example PCAPs from Wireshark.com. Um, you can install this pretty easily with analytics, like what they're going to do is just Wireshark dash PT is the file name. Um, there's all sorts of crazy filters you can do. Again, this is a whole other talk, but here you can get data to try to see what's going on. Um, you, you can drill down into the data. You can see the raw data in the packet here. This will actually tell you what the stuff in the packet means usually. Um, you can extract data that's sent out. We'll do it. Like you can see there's a get request and the page is getting to you. you can, Actually, see the page come back to you. You can pull out these images if you wanted to. Um, so, other good ways to try to figure out what the heck is going on um, if you're having issues. And then, application level stuff. So, that's the top three section of the OSI chart. A lot of that is handled by the same application. So, it's, that's why it's often working together. Um, it doesn't have to be, you could have parent child processes and applications or things like that. Um, yeah, if you do have some of those issues, 
ask for the developers. Don't tell me every chef you ask. <laughs> uh, if you are a developer, blame the network because that's so sort of developers are very important. <laughs> there's a lot of, you know, it's going back and eventually somebody solves it. Um, yeah, check the logs. Make sure you have the logs as an application side. Um, don't capture like sensitive information like social security numbers and stuff with maybe uh, temporary session information or requests or application error handling and stuff like that. So you can track down how these things application side. So like me as an end user, if I'm trying to connect to a website that I don't control, there's a problem on that website. Not a damn thing I can do about it. Like if I get an HTTP 500 error, which is server error, like that's on them. This is definitely not on me at that level. Um, but yeah, just grabbing these error messages, getting them to the right people, explaining the stuff you do, like, while well, them try to troubleshoot what's going on. A good uh, error report is worth its weight in gold. Just don't send a it no works. <laughs> right? <laughs> If you want it solved, send it out with detail error report. When, what you were doing, and what that you applies to mechanics as well. Mechanical love you if you can actually describe the problem in detail. Oh, and if if you're an end user, make sure you never blame the network. It's always the internet's fault. That is the network fault. <laughs> 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 And if you are also a developer with great logs, um, look at them from time to time because there's a lot of errors that like creep up that no one reports to you or <laughs> don't get to the level of breaking something and you can solve it before they become an issue. Or also, if you if everything is on fire and you're looking at logs and you're like, oh my gosh, I see this one error message every minute. And it's been that way for 10 years and that's never mattered. Then you know not to care about that error message. There's also a big risk of alarm fatigue. Yeah. If you're getting that error message and it's pinging your phone every one minute over the last 10 years, you're not going to actually be paying attention when the world actually does catch on fire. Well, then you need to filter that message out. So yes. Yeah. Yeah, usually that. It's been going for 10 years. No one's looked at it for 10 years. I feel targeted by this. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. As a person who scanned a large corporate network yeah. on a regular basis and dealing with the fallout from that and the blame for bringing down their precious services. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. but I, I'm guilty kind of <laughs> all of these things. <laughs> well, at least you never. You decided to filter out everything from your load balancer IP address from your login. <laughs> that is a real conversation I have with the same person and repeatedly. Yeah, uh, I, I think I did hear some old systems where you, you go and look at the logs and it's like, okay, are these normal errors or are these actually real, probative, useful errors? Yeah, I don't know. The last person to touch this was uh, at the company 10 years ago. Yeah, exactly. And, and so, like, some of those kind of network artifacts of that, that data would be you know, session information, get that number one server, that cookies, used for a session. Um, yeah, there's a lot of SSL certificate stuff within there. Like maybe a certificate expired and your web service is all not the old one. Maybe you have several different web servers on the same physical host responding for whatever dumb reason. Uh, I've seen that happen. I've seen a, a web server sitting up the, the, it was the application removed to another server and the sole purpose of this one web server is just to send redirects over to the other guy instead of changing the DNS record to point over there. Like, yeah, there's a lot of bad ways of doing things. Load balancers where one machine's down and the other one's up, so it works some of the time. You hit refresh, it comes back. Hey, there's no problem. 
Yeah, where you can have a cluster of servers and somebody update the software on four out of five, but you intermittently get a fifth one that's bad. And you try to explain to them that they they missed one of them in the cluster and they just go to a ramp. They hit the load balance and go, see, it's fine for me this one time I check. Yeah. There's a lot of complicated stuff that happens in the top two layers. And unless you really know how it's configured and how it works, you're not going to be able to troubleshoot it. VPN or not on VPN. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, that's a good way of, uh, of checking, too. It's like, let's say you have, uh, you're trying to connect to an internal IP, and you can't hard code to that IP, which is dumb, you shouldn't, but I've seen people set it up that way. That, that's the only thing you can do on the IP layer stack. You know, why is this specific thing connected to that? Uh, another issue is internal DS resolution. I can't connect this one thing on the that should I should be on the VPN for because I can't resolve the DNS. DNS is broken. No, you're not on the VPN. Like yeah. after we stop hitting record here, I, I've got some <laughs> stories. Right. But uh, same. <laughs> uh, well, I'm at the end of the line here. So. so so I do have a little bit on uh, taking it this next level to the uh, IPv6. Side of things. It's not near me as much around the how to troubleshoot it. It's more just okay, what the hell is IPv6 and what should we do with it? So here I'll quick flip around here. Uh, let's see here. IPv6, here we go. Open, please. Yeah, there we go. Close. There we go. Okay. So let me get my mouse back over here, share screen. The desktop too. So, so yeah, the uh the next part of this is IPv6 and Linux. So the first question is, oh, IPv4 works. Why the hell should I care? And uh, for one thing, the end is nigh. We are out of IPv4 addresses in, as an internet. There's a robust sale and trade of them. And pretty much you'll eventually someday, the day is coming where you'll just put, be put behind a carrier grade NAT and sure you, you'll kind of get that. You'll get access to the, uh, the IPv4 network, but it will be a sad, sad little show of its former self and it will only kind of work. There's uh, some self providers doing that right now. Yeah, T-Mobile, casting side eyes at you. But uh, so more and more as time goes on, yes, you'll still get your IPv4, but it's going to be a bizarro land, and uh, you're going to have to share with everybody else. So uh, the, the problem is, well, yes, the end is nigh. Nobody cares. <laughs> uh, these are the stats from the Internet Society uh, looking at like Google, Facebook, etc. And like 30, maybe 40% of the, the Internet is going over IPv6 for even these big sites that are doing everything right. So, yeah, here we are. But you know what? Let, let's go ahead and uh, boldly go forward about the a little bit about it. Most of the things that Sean talked about in IPv4, they're still the same. ARC doesn't apply, but I mean, the, the OSI layers and all that stuff, yeah. And really, if you're doing it right for the foreseeable future, we're going to have to deal with both. So it's not like you, you can forget everything about IP, IPv4. And uh, the, the good news is we have uh, a lot of IP addresses there. Uh, 340, yeah, you can read it. There's a lot of them. Uh, I think I saw a, a chat message. Oh, it's just me, John. So. Oh, 
Okay, uh, never mind then. Uh, right, there's more IPv6 addresses than atoms in the universe. Yep. So there's basically, even if we're as wasteful with IPv4 or IPv6 addresses as we were with IPv4, uh, over if you go start handing out whole segments of the network and it's okay, our children's children will have to worry about it, maybe not us. But uh, so yeah, the, the big thing is where uh, they were nice, cute addresses uh, before in IPv4 that you can easily remember. Yeah, ain't nobody gonna remember that. The good news is there usually are at least a few segments of zeros there, and you can short circuit those out by just not talking about them. So uh, that, that helps make things a little less tidy. So there's really two big, there are three big uh, types of addresses that you're going to care about. Unicast, you're going to one spot. Multicast, I'm talking to everybody. But the good news is in this space, I don't have to send a packet. Jared, I don't have to send you to you to you to you. I can just shout from the mountain and everybody hears it. And well, any cast, uh, say you walk up to McDonald's, you talk to one of the people, and you don't care who gets you your hamburger, just as long as you get it. And uh, so, uh, like, for example, the multicast, a uh, big usage of it is in like, uh, uh, video on demand content where uh, we all may be watching the that one movie, but basically anybody who wants to can uh, tune into that one uh, topic basically and uh, stream that one channel. Yeah, it's like a live stream. So like say if you're watching Channel 8, watching the news, you don't have to spend all that bandwidth to broadcast or send each individual connection stream. Uh, you can just uh, cast it to everybody. And of course, now if you're starting to talk about uh, on demand, well, that's of course a different color. And yeah, unfortunately, that's still unicast. Yeah. And then any cast is that mostly used for like geolocation services? So, like, or geo specific? So, like, let's say if you're in the US and you request for more of the DNS servers. Yeah, you know, or it's sort of like, well, you're in the US, the US will more answer and send you to the US resource. Whereas if you're in Asia, the Asian DNS server will respond to you to the Asian resource. Yeah, an IPv4 version of it uh, is the 8.8.8 uh, uh, Google DNS. They, there are many of them out there. And the one nearest to you is the one that answers, or the one that your network ends up getting routed to ends up being the one to answer. A uh, big uh, anycast option would be like, you, you have uh, multiple servers in your data center and you want to download this file, it's cached on all of them. You don't care which one you get it from. That, that way the whole uh, corporate uh, service can uh, not go down when everyone wants to download their patch. Gotcha. But so the big advantage, advantages, IPv6 in theory is going to be more reliable because it's new, shiny, has a bunch of better features. Like, for example, it's easier to uh, route uh, because they, they've taken out a bunch of stuff. But there's a little bit of an asterisk to that because, uh, for example, routing wise, it's all mostly done in software. So, especially if you have a crappy uh, modem you're going to have a bad time. Uh, it's a little bit better with multicast uh, instead of being the old IPv4 version of broadcast. Uh, in theory, IPv or, uh, IPsec uh, security was supposed to be baked into it. They sort of uh, threw in the towel and uh, made that kind of optional. But I mean, for the most part, it, it, if it does support it, you, you have a chance of being more secure. And really face it, we've got to bite the bullet sometime, rip that band-aid off, the future is now. And uh, so a lot bigger address space like I talked about, we've got multicasting. Uh, you also don't have to have a DHCP server. 
Uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit here, but basically by a virtue of auto configuration, you uh, via the neighbor discovery protocol, you just shout out and the nearest uh, router will hook you up. You can set up a DHCP uh, server if you're a stupid corporate person who just can't deal with the times, or you can manually hard code it too if you want to set up a server. But I mean, really, unless you're standing up a web server or something like that, or a file server, or one of those things where you need to have an IP address and set up DNS and all that stuff, just don't bother. It, it will handle itself. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about neighboring uh, discovery in a minute. But in theory, it's supposed to be easier because they've gotten rid of and simplified the headers. Uh, but especially on the cheaper stuff, it's all CPU based and using like your central main uh, processor for your Wi Fi point. So that's why on the, the cheaper routers, you're going to have a bad time. But they've gotten rid of some of the uh, checksumming sort of stuff in the, the uh, header itself. So that saves a little bit of time. You might have a little more errors, but hey, networking is cheap. Uh, and also, you don't have to worry about fragmenting your uh, packets. That, that's no longer a thing. You either have to figure out what is your, your biggest packet that you can have, or just don't go bigger than the, the minimum, and you'll be fine. Yeah, so sometimes with encapsulation, at least IPv4, you can accidentally get fragments. Yep. That's why they, they have that set low enough that that, that should be help get you around that. But uh, then one thing I mentioned CRC in one of my slides, and that's the uh, checksum. So just to clarify, since I use the macro in the this later. Yep. And uh, yeah, so uh, what's the difference? Uh, also still continuing here uh, for mobility of like uh, IP or for like cell phone networking and stuff like that. They got rid of the fact that you can have your router bounced up around uh, and some other really nice to have enhancements, but pretty much unless you're a cell phone company, you'll, you're not gonna worry about that. Uh, they, they also have where you can have sort of auxiliary part of extendable headers really no one's using it right now all that much and also once you leave your local network uh those uh extended headers probably are going to get stripped off just because uh there's no guarantee uh the other big news uh there uh in pun intended is if you want to send a very very large packet you can uh the jumble brands in IPv4 were limited to uh, two to the 16 minus one uh, octets worth of data. They're a lot bigger in IPv6, and that can help uh, move large amounts of files. If you have a large file or a large payload of stuff you want to move, there's a lot less overhead if you can uh, just send it as one big thing. The other problem is, though, if something goes wrong and you have to retransmit it, that hurts. Uh, so in the disadvantage side of things, IPv4 is simple. It's easy to understand. I could sit up there and whiteboard how to route stuff, and it's easy. IPv6, I mean, my printer doesn't understand it. I, I have to get a new router. But honestly, at this point, if you've gotten a router in the last 10 years, just click that thing to enable it, you'll be fine. But also now I've got to deal with, uh, there's no way to communicate uh, from IPv6 to IPv4 without some special magic happening. And uh, you know what, it just means there's yet another thing to break because I, it's yet another channel that you're talking about. Uh, so there is a path forward in transitioning uh, most places you're going to see an IPv6 stack and an IPv4 stack, and then they'll just work. Uh, some uh, providers, especially like your cell phones, are going to IPv6 only, and then doing that IPv4 mapping where they, they'll have a carrier grade map that will be sitting there and translate it. Uh, 
you can also deal like media town will just give you an ipv6 address as well so that you'll stack stuff happening there uh now it used to be on a dsl for uh like your uh century link and those folks they had a service called 6rd which basically was just encapsulating and you talk to a server and then it would talk to the ipv6 internet for you Torito is another one, six to four was another one. Basically, think of it as you're uh, talking to an IPv4 uh, uh, machine that then is on your behalf going out uh, onto IPv6 and passing messages back and forth. Yeah, Torito also has some security implications because it will tunnel things through in a way that you're, you may not want with your firewall rules. Yeah, there's a reason why, uh, especially a couple of those, you really don't see anymore. Uh, the fun story of the Detrito is actually originally was known as uh, Shipworm, I think, for the fact that it can tell through stuff. Yeah. And yeah, so it's one of those where uh, 6RG is mostly harmless, but uh, the, the other stuff, uh, if you're setting it up, you, you're probably, you should know what you're doing because you're, you could have some bad uh, surprises there. Yeah, Trino is just the one by the fault of one of the risk versions. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Mistakes were made. <laughs> by Microsoft? No. But so I'm not joking. <laughs> yes. Uh, one of the spots that you're going to see a lot of IPv6 is like in some of the larger cable companies uh, because each of their set top boxes have an IP address. Uh, you're, you're seeing a lot of IP6 only uh, stuff in those uh, larger deployments because they're out of IPv4s and uh, some of their stuff goes big enough that, especially if you're a little wasteful, a Class A network is gonna, uh, you're gonna run out of IP addresses, and it's just a pain. Uh, Hurricane Electric is a 6RD, isn't it? If you don't have IP version 6 and you want it on your IP version 4 connection, you can use Hurricane Electric, I think it is, uh, yes. to get a tunnel Hurricane to IP version 6 tunnel. I did that before Mediacom had it natively. Yeah, I, I used to use them as well. Uh, the, the biggest uh, pain point I had with them is whenever your IP address would change, uh, you had to reset back up the tunnel, at least when I was doing it. Uh, yeah, IPv4. by the time I got to it, there was a dynamic IP uh, updater for it. But I don't use that anymore now that Mediacom has native IP version 6. That was one of those things where I played with it for a couple minutes and then especially since uh, like streaming over Netflix and stuff like that, you gave her, since uh, you, you had to travel outside your local network, uh, it just made for a worse experience and it just really wasn't worth it other than saying, yay, I'm IPv4 or IPv6. So maybe with the dynamic updater, I might be working that. Yeah. But like, like you know, I, I'm, I'm now on MediaCom and uh, IPv6 just works. So neighborhood discovery, how it basically works is sort of like ARP. You just shout out into the, the ether, hey, is there a router nearby? I need a router. And the router responds back with an advertisement, yes, I'm a router. Here's the information you need of uh, what the, the uh, MTU is, uh, what your uh, address space is, all of those sort of things. This is what you need to know. Or, hey, is Jared around? Yes, Jared's around. There are those sort of art things. It's now called the Neighborhood Discovery Protocol. And uh, if Jared didn't answer, well, then I know that he's not around anymore. It will also give you information of how to talk to the local nearest DNS server, all of those sort of things. There's also a famous vulnerability in that. Uh, gosh, eight years ago or so, something like that. Um, where it's a huge denial of service issue, and you can maliciously respond back and bring down the entire network. <laughs> yes, and it's still actually probably a big concern because it's easy enough uh, to just spam. Yeah, it's just there's with anything new, there haven't, haven't been enough people poking at it to find flaws. And so, like, yeah, 
there's probably one out there. Oh, most certainly. You can also poison by uh, uh, answering uh, to the question, is there a router nearby? Yes, I'm a router. Send me all of your packets. Yeah, I mean, same thing with Mac addresses too. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, more Wi Fi be off. So, yeah. I want IPv6. What do I need to do? Well, the first thing is if you set up your uh, uh, router right to uh, get your, uh, uh, your IPv6 working based on whatever you have to do, whether it be set up 6RD if you're on CenturyLink or Mediacom, just put the yes, I want IPv6. And then basically, yeah, if your machine set up to be a dual stack, you'll get an IPv6 address. And then you just start using the internet like you would normally. And so like, say for example, here I went to my website and there you can see it worked. I got an IPv6 address and used the IPv6. Uh, you can also, if you know that there is a website out there that is IPv6 only, like uh, this one from Google, then that forces it over. Or if you want to say, make sure is my IPv4 working, or you just swap that six for a four, and it just works. No. And then the other big thing as a call out and plea to the world, if you have a web server or other service out there on the internet, and you have the availability to set it up as a dual stack, be that change you want to be in the world. Set it up. Stop with just the, the uh, uh, IPv4 only if you can. And uh, so then, uh, how can I know my stuff's working? Well, uh, IPv6-test.com uh, has a good suite of telling you what stuff you're doing wrong. Currently, I've got some stuff to work on, but uh, just quick ran this because I'm really not sure what our IP uh, network status is here. And I didn't really want to try and do a demo since I knew we were going to be short on time here for that. But uh, so I've got some screenshots of some stuff showing here. And as uh, Sean was uh, hinting at, here you can see this is my Wi-Fi uh, connection, and you can see that uh, I've got uh, a couple different IPv6 addresses. One is called secure, and one is temporary. So now you wonder, well, secure, what's the difference between that and temporary? Secure uh, gives you a little bit of uh, privacy, but it's also uh, long as I'm connected to that internet connection, I'm going to keep that IP address and it doesn't rotate at all. So you can use it as sort of discoverability to know if I come back to see your website again tomorrow. Well, yes, it's still me, Mario. Uh, where this one, uh, the, the temporary, it rotates and it will only keep a hold of it and respond uh, for a week by default, if I remember right. But as you can see here, by default, uh, we've got an IP uh, v4 and some IPv6s and et cetera here. Uh, you can also hear just as an example of just using dig. Uh, if you do just nothing, you'll get whatever your uh, machine sees is best, which it decided to go for the IPv6 uh, address. And as you can see, that's really long and nasty and obnoxious. If you, a lot of these services, if you do a dash four, you'll end up getting the, the IPv4 version of it uh, or a dash six. Sometimes some of them, you'll have to put a six in the number to get it to work. Uh, for example, uh, here's big, big dash six, again, just showing, but uh, like traceroute, the, the version of traceroute that will use IPv6 is traceroute six. And then the URL you're, yeah, a domain name you're trying to get to. And here you can see it. Uh, I, I had some issues there, but uh, TraceRoute 6 of iState.edu, I know they've got some nice polite networking stuff. And here you can see as it's traversing Mediacom stuff, 
hits the uh, U of I and then bounces over to Iowa State's internal network here. Wait, it goes to U of I first? I, <laughs> uh, they, they've got some weird networking stuff that goes across the ICM. Okay. But one of those where I, it's all the same team, I guess, in the end. Or don't tell it to their sports teams. I, I know. But the, the ICN is a great network. I really miss having the internet to sweep pipe to draw uh, stuff across. But yeah, the, that was the, the big set of uh, demo that uh, I had there. And if I timed this right, hey, I was within five minutes of when I thought we'd get done. So not, not bad for throwing it together like an hour before I came. So, yeah, that, that was uh, uh, the IPv6 stuff. Uh, let's go ahead and hit uh, stop here. If I can find the step recording button.